trying to mold a new type of creative world, a creative commons, as Larry Glessig tried to call it, um, a way for people to share and reuse information that's been very productive. But we need to know the answer of how will we have a creative economy? How will people make money from creative work in the really distant future? Because in the really distant future, we're talking about a world where possibly nanoforges can make just about anything, that manufactured goods no longer have value as manufactured goods because they're easy to copy. In fact, I identify five sources of value in a world where you can get copies of anything physical. Um, these are raw materials. Uh, raw materials, are you have to have those to some level, although only a few of them are rare. This only scales to a limited extent. Uh, the biggest one is services, and that includes both personal services, which don't scale, but also online services that do. Things like managing attention and creative services, being, you know, giving a private concert for someone. That's a kind of service that people will do in the future. Um, we'll actually still find value in locations. There will still be cool places to live. Are there beautiful places to live? Or just places where the cool people are living, uh, that you cannot create, a, until you can copy people, you can't create uh, extra ones of that. And there'll always be somewhere that is the cool neighborhood and the cool address. Um, there will be, I believe, in the future in this world, a fetishism for originals. Uh, there will be some people who say, even though the exact copy is absolutely identical at the molecular level, this one was touched by the artist. This one is signed by Stan. Um, it's suddenly a great deal more valuable. Uh, and then the final thing that might be of value is creative work if you can find a way to sell it in quantity as opposed to doing a private concert, which doesn't scale. So the movies, the software, all that creative work. How will people be able to make money from that? So here's a survey of some of the attitudes about that. And the first one that comes up is just people saying that, forget about it, copyright is dead, there's not going to be a way to do that. Um, certainly computers are very good at copying things and it's really, really difficult to design computers so that they can't copy them. But a lot of people think IP was a mistake. I think I'm not ready to go down that route because I wonder what's going to fund the fourth estate, the very important press, criticism, investigative journalism that serves as a check and balance on the government around the world. And what's going to fund the blockbusters, the movies like Avatar? If you cannot sell copies of it, you will not get the funding to make that. Some may say that's no great tragedy. We can lose a few Avatars, a few Titanics. But I think it's still an interesting question. Many people have gone to point to taxes as, of course, we're going to have death, we have to have taxes. Um, and they have proposed that we do this at the government, basically fund all art and creativity. There will either be a general tax and then artists can receive money from it, or there will be media taxes. There have been in the past in some countries taxes on blank CDs, taxes on DAT tapes. Um, there are private tax-like operations such as ASCAP and BMI, which go to all the music halls and extract a fee from them and distribute that money to the uh, music composers, so they can get a share of what they, when their work is performed. There's the copyright clearinghouse, which exert, and I get checks from it from time to time as a writer. Um, so this is one of the solutions that people for. The biggest hole in this is you create a world where basically all artists and creative work are working for the government. Um, and not to say that can't succeed. The BBC is a reasonably successful operation that works in that way from a television tax. But I think there's a concern if there's only one funder of the arts, and so that's something not to be universal. A lot of people, of course, in the media industries are focusing on DRM as the possible solution to things. Um, as I mentioned, so DRM uh, is generally not that successful on a broad scale. Almost everything that's out there that is protected by DRM very quickly becomes available on what have been known as the dark nets. You know, you can get to a BitTorrent cloud. I'm also on the board of BitTorrent. Um, the, um, you can get to, uh, that's the technology, of course. It does not itself uh, provide the files. Other people use it as a technology to do that. You can get to um, uh, things out there, and the DRM has not been entirely successful. However, to make DRM work, you have to actually lock down all media playing devices. And unfortunately, that means locking down all general purpose computers and tablets and phones in a way that really burdens them. And this has been caused a major backlash against DRM. <coughs> the truth is that copying is so fundamental to computers that trying to make computers which can't copy that particular book or piece of music is a very, very difficult challenge. And in fact, I've talked to people in the uh, content industry and music industry, and if you get them drunk enough, they'll admit they know this. Um, but they just don't know what else to do. And so we've built this large regime of DRM. So uh, another group of people have decided that the way is to, to deal with the massive copying is to make legal attacks on all technologies. Uh, I even coined a term for this I call spamigation, 
where you actually sue a thousand people at once. It's kind of like spamming them, except it's a little more serious, the thing that you get in your, in your mailbox. So you, many people have seen this. They, they find everyone who was in a, a file sharing cloud or everyone who uh, went and downloaded a certain file and they all find a lawsuit. Conveniently, the cost of selling the lawsuit is just a little bit cheaper than the cost of defending it with a lawyer. So that uh, you have no reason not to, you have no reason to fight and they actually get a lot of money from people who might actually have been innocent. And they've tried to shut down ISPs. They've tried to shut down entire technologies, built-in laws like the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. You're all familiar with that. I hope there's no one needs too much uh, refresher on that, um, to make technologies actually illegal, uh, which, which can surpass the DRM, for example. Uh, there was surprising foresight in the law built during the 90s, laws which gave safe harbors to ISPs and online services so they could exist without being a fear of being taken down and having to police everything that appeared there. But we're still seeing a lot of effort in this area to, to sue everyone. Um, now, a lot of people have looked for hope in the idea of micropayments. Uh, micropayments doesn't mean PayPal or credit cards, which still have 20 to 30 cent fees in order to conduct a transaction, but systems that could workably give you pennies of, or ch charges of less than a penny, so you could pay per click or per page some tiny amount of money. And Xanadu and many other systems hoped to have a micropayment infrastructure for content. Uh, no one has succeeded at making a micropayment system work. And there are a number of theories about that. I'll present my own approach, which is to say that I believe there is a human cost to paying a tenth of a penny, which is much greater than a tenth of a penny. Uh, that humans don't like thinking about financial transactions at the very small size. They don't like meters running, even if the meters are very cheap. And I think this has driven people away from building a truly successful micropayment infrastructure. We're getting a little closer with things like iTunes, where 99 cent transactions and so on are getting particularly common. But certainly there's been no success at getting these sub-penny or just a couple of penny transactions. Um, a lot of people believe the answer can come by saying, fine, we won't have DRM, we can't have the protection, but actually people are reasonably trustworthy. Yes, a lot of people are accessing copyrighted works and other protected works without paying for them, but a lot of people with reasonable prices uh, and usable systems actually are pretty happy to pay and are paying. And the whole uh, CD, the MP3s, which lost the DRM recently, continue to sell very well, not as well as the music industry would like, but still reasonably successfully. Um, so people wonder if you might go a little further than just simply trusting. There might be an idea to build a systems that are kind of like DRM in some ways, but they don't actually enforce, they just remind. They say, you get a badge to say, look, I'm a, I'm a supporter of this band. You know, I, I, not only do I listen to this band, but here's a little a token from them that says, yes, they've actually uh, paid for our music or paid for this writer and love this writer. Or, or just simply a thing popping up saying, by the way, we notice you've read every single book Stan Robinson has written, maybe you should send a couple of bucks his way, right? <laughs> Stan says a few more than a couple of bucks if you're going to read all the books. Uh, so, and a lot of people might in honesty work with that and, and go with that without actually having a, any kind of lock and so on and force to place that. Um, another solution which I actually think is, is, is a likely one is there's something that's going to come along that we don't know what it is yet. Um, that, you know, I don't know how it's going to work out, it's a mystery. Um, as the character from Shakespeare in Love used to always say, and this is a bit facile, uh, because if someone else is saying my industry is dying and we say don't worry about it something will come up <laughs> They don't like the answer, but in fact that's been the true answer every time there have been battles fought over all the changes in technological media when VCRs came out when movies came out when talkies came out when television came out when radio and all these VCR when all these technologies came out there was a general cry of oh my god This is going to disrupt my industry. What are we going to do and people say, I don't know yet that something's going to come up It's a mystery and it, it did it did. Now, again, it's not a very satisfactory answer to many people, but I believe it's something that belongs in this canon of potential solutions. Um, another thing that uh, I think is kind of waning in, uh, in its success right now, but has been advanced for a long time, is the idea of voluntary gifts, tips and donations and shareware, and then at the larger scale, patronage. Now, as you may know, for a long time, that was the only way the arts were funded. Uh, you got the Emperor of Austria to decide that he liked your music and he put you up in a nice apartment and he had you write music and he paid to have your concerts go on. Um, this, of course, created a lot of billionaire-focused art, uh, or king or nobleman-focused art. There's no question that it bent things in that direction. But that was the... Oh, no, no, my clock says I have much more than that. Uh, <laughs> we have to close at five. Okay. We have another All right. after you. 
Anyway, so very, very, very quickly, uh, the tips and shareware, that's the tip drive's not working super well. I have another alternative. A lot of people are focusing on doing things other than selling copies. Uh, of course, advertising is by far the most successful, but there's people trying to say, you know, cultivate some real fans who pay you, sell associated projects and t-shirts and other uh, things that go on, selling support, companies like Red Hat, of course, have made big business, selling support for software that itself is free, live performance and so on. This is another one of the, the directions people are going. A whole completely different direction is something that Charlie Strauss gave the name Economics 2.02. The idea that there are future modes of economics coming. Economies of appreciation, many of you may have heard the term wuffy from Cory Doctorow's fabulous first novel down out in the Magic Kingdom, a civilization where reputation and so on becomes the currency. Uh, another great story I'll refer you to is Bruce Sterling's Mackineco, where an AI is basically coordinating economics between people. And the picture I put up is one of uh, Burning Man, where we have an economy of appreciation. And people, I'm an artist there, people are nice to me because I do art there. And I'm nice to other people who are there, and people appreciate it, and no money changes hand in that world, and it's, it's, it's another way. I'll very briefly mention the uh, one final method that I've proposed, it's not implemented yet, it's the idea of taking the micropayment concept and reversing it, saying that everything is quite cheap, uh, and you're not even aware that you're spending it because you can get your money back at any time and within a month or so. And so at the end of the month, if your bill is too high, you can go and look and say, oh, I don't want to pay for that one. And changes the default from not paying to changing the default to paying which I think would have a remarkable effect on how much money flows through to artists. Uh, you'd have to have a service that stopped people from gaming it, where people subscribe saying, just refund anyone, any of these assholes, because they were running around charging too much money. So uh, if you want to talk to me later about exploring that. So what's going to be the final solution? I have to say, so far, um, it's a mystery. Uh, I don't know if we have time for one question, but let's, uh, let's see if we can put that in and get on to the next one. You're all stymied? No questions? All right. Oh, get back there. Brad, uh, during the internet boom, I was the CTO of Live365.com, and uh, I spent uh, a very unpleasant morning in the RIA offices being threatened uh, personally. That's redundant? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, they threatened me personally, uh, to sue me personally, as well as the corporation. So I'll just put that out there. I also spent a morning in Arista Records, where a gentleman told me, a uh, new media at Arista Records, he was going to crush us. Uh, we were operating under the safe harbor uh, uh, laws and attempting to be legal, unlike uh, Napster 1.0, but that was their, their uh, combative mode of thinking, and I don't think it, I'm not out of the loop, but I don't think it's changed. Well, no, uh, so these are people who, uh, you know, had this come blindside them, and, uh, you know, I sort of see it as, uh, to take a metaphor from the movie industry, I see dead people, they don't know they're dead. Um, and so they're going to fight. And people do def fight to defend what they have, especially if they have a lot of money, they fight to defend it. The same thing happened with Napster. Now, there's a reason why they had no love for Napster. But when it finally came time to actually do a deal with them and create something that would have been actually productive, would have been the iTunes Music Store four years before the iTunes Music Store, the bitterness over what had happened before did indeed cause those parties to butt heads and just uh, sue each other. Well, Napster got sued out of existence. Anyway, that's all the time we have, so thanks very much. Amy's here. Yay.